Anyway, preachers come and go. Uh, at some point, this church, I don't know, may not even be here 10 years from now, 20 years from now, who knows. One thing I do know is I've got a Bible that is over 400 years old. In fact, I, I want to do something. Steve, I'm going to trust you with something. I want you to go in my office, and on the wall there, the right-hand side of the couch, there is a, a big um, thing up there, and it has that page out of that 1611 Bible. Would you bring that out here? <clears throat> and we'll just, we'll just set it up here. I meant, to, I meant to bring it out before we got started with the meetings uh, yesterday, and I just forgot to do it. had so many other things on my mind. Uh, a, a friend of our ministry, and he, I think he may be watching today. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is, uh, but he's been just a good, good friend of our ministry, and, and I appreciate him, and his family's gone through a lot, our family's gone through a lot. And just kind of set, set that just right there. That is, when, when I got that in the mail, the glass was, was busted out of it. But the frame was still intact. And when I looked at it, I immediately knew what it was. That is not a reprint of a page from the 1611 Bible. That is a page from the 1611 King James Bible. And I didn't know you could get those, <clears throat> but he, it had a certificate that went with it, and I forgot the website that you go to, but you can still get, uh, you can buy a page and have it framed as a, as a gift to send it to people or to keep it for yourself. They do have, and in, they do have entire editions of the King James uh, they're upwards in the tens of thousands of dollars um, because they're rare. But when I, when I opened that box up and saw what it was, I started crying. I did. I started bawling. I knew what it was. And I appreciated him sending that to me. But years ago, when I was on the other side of this Bible issue, and some of you have heard this story, I went to a, um, a, a conference, a, a Free Will Baptist denomination conference, and there was going to be a lecture given by a professor of one of the colleges that I went to. I didn't have him as a professor of any of my classes, but I knew him, I'd known of him for years. When I was a little boy, he came and preached at this church one time, I think. And uh, I think I've got a picture of him somewhere down in our church basement. But anyway, uh, he was the esteemed Greek professor at the big seminary. And he was going to have a lecture on the King James Bible issue. And at that time, I was on the other side of all of this and one I can remember one of the things that he said in fact really his biggest argument against those who said they believed only in the 1611 authorized Bible he asked this question if you say you believe the King James Bible which King James Bible do you believe and he said, do you believe the 1611 version of the King James Bible? Or do you believe the 1619 version of the King James Bible? Or do you believe the 1648? He reeled off several editions that had been reprinted since 1611. What he wanted to do is he wanted to make it sound like that the Bible that those preachers were holding in their hand at that time was significantly different than the original 
printing of the 1611 King James Bible. And I can remember at that time going, yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. Y'all don't even know what you're talking about. You think you've got the 1611 Bible. Well, this esteemed doctor here says you don't. And I believed him, hook, line, and sinker. And uh, left that meeting feeling confident in what I believed in and so on. Then, of course, I've told this story so many times, God just woke me up one day. Sitting in my office in there. And God knew what he was doing. God had... I, I can remember a, there was a day when I was sitting in my office. And years ago, our church had a little library... People would come and check books out and, you know, Christian books and so on. And we didn't, we didn't have a room for the library anymore. And all the books from the library were in these boxes uh, downstairs in a storage room. And the Holy Ghost got a hold of me one day and I, he literally showed me where this particular book was in those boxes. I'm not kidding you. Kevin, I got up. And he told me to go, he told me what room to go into, what box to look at, and exactly what book to look for. And it, it was right there where, where I found it. And it was, uh, it was a book on the sort of the history of America and how America really was begun as a Christian nation. And I began, and I read that book, and I, and I was just very, very blessed by it. I did, there was a lot of things I didn't know. And then I started just making the analogy between America and the foundation of America and the foundation of Israel as its own independent nation after it left Egypt. And the, the man who wrote the book was a man by the name of Peter Marshall. And... Um, no, he's not the guy from Hollywood Squares. He was a, it was a different Peter Marshall. But he wrote this book and he explained that our early settlers, the, the pilgrims and whatnot we call them, as they were coming across the sea and coming to this land, they could clearly see that they were a type of Israel leaving a land of bondage because they were in bondage. They were in bondage either to the Church of Rome or the Church of England. And especially under Mary, Queen of Scots, before King James ever came along, those early Puritan believers were, were being murdered by the Queen of England. When King James came along, he, did, he, he put a stop to all of that and became openly tolerant of the early Puritan believers. And at the time, he wanted a Bible that wasn't just a Church of England Bible and it wasn't just a Puritan Bible, but it was a common Bible for all believers who read and understood and spoke the, the English language, he wanted a common Bible for every one of them. And I remember it had been a few weeks after I read that book, and I was sitting in my office, and I'm just meditating. I'm thinking on these things. And it was a series of thoughts, and I got to the end of the road of those thoughts, and whammo, God said, Mike, that Bible's right. And I instantly believed it. And then I got hungry. I said, God, I want you to show me evidence. I believe you. But give me something that I can give to others that they also can be convinced as well. And I won't tell you any names, but... There have been several preachers who have come to me and said, uh, Brother Mike, you're the reason why I now only use the King James. And um, we, when we did a conference, 
years ago for Southwest Radio Ministries. We were out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And they had a bunch of books for sale. And my wife found a 1611 reprint of the King James Bible. And she bought that for me to give me as a gift for my birthday. And when I opened that up and saw that in there, I did. I, I started crying again. And what I did then was I just took that Bible and I started reading out loud from it. And I would read from that Bible and I would listen to myself read and I would be saying to myself, Mike, you can't tell the difference reading this Bible out loud between it and a, just a King James Bible that you've got in your hand right now, but have everlasting life. And they were exactly the same. So let, let me do this very quickly. Let me, let me take this. And I want you to open your Bible to Exodus chapter, let's see, XXIX would be, that's 29, so let's go to 20, Exodus uh, 28, look at verse 24. Now, it is a little difficult to read because it is in a uh, sort of a Germanic Old English typeface. But look at verse 24 of your Bible. And let's ask ourselves the question, has the Bible been changed in over 400 years? Verse 24. And thou shalt put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of of the, um, don't tell, don't tell me, don't tell me, of the breastplate. Sure. So far? Verse 25, and the other two ends of the two wreathen chains, thou shalt fasten in the two ounces and put them in the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. Verse 26. And thou shalt make the two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. Check. Oh, let's see here. Oh, this is my favorite. Look at verse 28. And see, this is important. This, this, what I'm going to read here is very important. And they shall, uh, they shall bind the breastplate of the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. Verse 29. This verse is important. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Now, I don't know if you understand what that verse is talking about. But Aaron was to wear a breastplate. And on that breastplate was a series of jewels. One jewel for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was a different jewel. And etched into the jewel was the name of whatever particular tribe... God told him to write on there. So he had 12 stones, jewel stones, and on each of the 12 stones, he had a tribe of the, of the children of Israel on that breastplate. He's wearing it right here. And God said basically this, when Aaron, the high priest, 
on the day of atonement goes in to the most holy place. Number one, he's the only human being ever allowed in the most holy place. When he goes into the most holy place, and he's taking that blood that he is going to sprinkle upon the ark seven times to atone for the sins of Israel. When he goes in, he goes in bearing the names of the tribes of Israel on his heart. That's where we get that phrase, I've had you on my heart. That's where we get that. And what that means is, man, it's just something about, I don't know what's going on, but, I've, and I've had, I've had people call me, I've had preachers call me, Brother Mike, is everything going okay? Sometimes I'll say, actually it's not, and they'll say, Yo, well, God told me to call you then because... You've just been on my heart for the last few days and I just wanted to call and encourage you and let you know I was praying for you. God had written a stone and put my name on their stone and put it on their heart. And when they prayed, I was on their heart when, when they were praying. And that's, that's what that verse is saying. Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel and the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. You know what that means? That means to this day, Jesus has the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on his heart continuously. They'll never go away. He'll never forget them. And he will always bear their burdens and his love for them on his heart. Until the one day when he is able to call all of them and all of us home to be with him forever. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you think it's important that we just leave these words alone and don't mess with them? And don't change them, don't alter them. Amen. Amen. I'm walking real careful because I'm clumsy and I don't want to drop this. If you'd like to come up later, chill, I, I want to ask the kids not to touch that. But if any of you want to come up later and take a look at it, you're more than welcome to. And, um, well, anyway, praise the Lord. Everybody have a good lunch. Everybody had a good time. I'm going to ask again, um, before I get into this next session, uh, did, does anybody have any questions on what it was that we... All the things that we were speaking about in the earlier session this morning. I usually wait till the end of the day, but by the end of the day, I'm all tired and wore out and everything. My voice is gone. And so while I'm still thinking about it and while I can still think, does anybody have any questions about the issue of UFOs, what they are, the aliens, what they are, are, are they real, um, what is their agenda, why is it that they have not just come down and invaded the world and what are they waiting on or anything like that does anybody have any questions on any of those issues that we talked about this morning anybody yes kevin do what Okay. Well, that might be that might be all right, but I think you misfired. Well, that is part of it. It is a it is a multiple of three. And let's tell you what. Let's do this. Let's have a little fun since you brought that up. He's asking about. Uh, last night I brought up the 27 Club, and I believe there's, there is something to it. There's absolutely something to it. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Uh, even uh, when they rebooted the Star Trek film series, they made three movies. They were slated to make some more 
uh, the, the team that they had, Chris Pine and some of those other guys, they couldn't get them agreed to a contract. And so they just, they just dropped it. But one of, the, one of the stars that they had in this latest um, Star Trek reload um, was a young man playing Ensign Chekhov from the original Star Trek TV series. Uh, what was his name? I just had his name on the tip in my mouth and I got to talk about other things and forgot about it. But anyway, uh, he was a real Russian actor and he's playing um, Anton Yeltsin is his name. And he's playing Chekhov uh, from the Star Trek series. Anton Yeltsin had a side gig that he did in that he was a member of a rock band. And when Anton Yeltsin, wanted, and just after they got done filming the third of the three movie Star Trek series, he was, um, he had just pulled in his driveway and it was a driveway that was up on a hill. It's California. You, you know, most people live on a hill. So he walked down to check his mail in his mailbox. And while he was down there looking through his mail, his car suddenly slipped out of gear, got into neutral somehow, some way, rolled backwards and rolled over him and killed him. And he was 27 years old. And I just... I'm just going, there is no way. So if you go to Wikipedia, Wikipedia will actually, if you type in 27 Club, Wikipedia will actually give you, there's a brief article about it, and give you a list of all the names of rock and roll stars and so on that died at the age of 27 years old. Now, the first that we are aware of who was in rock and roll and who died at the age of 27. Does anybody know who it was? Robert Johnson. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? He is known as the father of rock and roll. Robert Johnson grew up in the deep south and he liked to hang out. His, his daddy was a real hard-working man, wanted his son to be a hard worker. And, and he didn't want none of it. He wanted to play his guitar. He wanted to sing blues. And his only problem was he couldn't play the guitar and he couldn't sing. But he would go to these honky-tonks and he would hang out with them other guys that were playing in the band. And he'd always try to squeeze himself in there. And he was a lousy player. Couldn't sing. Couldn't hardly hit half the notes. Couldn't keep up with the other guys. And nobody liked him showing up. So in, basically, in a way, they told him, get out of here and don't ever come back because you stink. So Robert Johnson, there's a documentary on Netflix about this. Part of the movie of Oh Brother Where Art Thou had this story included in it. Robert Johnson went out to a cross in the road, a crossroad. And he stood there and he asked specifically for the devil to come to him. And he said, I'll give you whatever you want if you will make me a rock and roll blues singer. Six months later, he returns and they're going, oh my goodness, there's Bobby Johnson again. What are we going to do with this guy? He sits down on a chair and he starts playing things on the guitar that nobody had ever, no, and the other guys are watching him going, how is he doing that? He was so good, he added an extra string to his guitar. And instead of playing six strings, he was playing seven strings on his guitar. 
He had written several songs, and one of them was about that night meeting the devil at the crossroads. And all of a sudden now, he's making money. He's got women hanging all over him. He's a heavy drinker. But he's got everything he asked for. He wanted the fame. He got the fame. He wanted to record albums. He recorded albums. He wanted to write songs. He started writing songs. He wanted to be able to play the guitar better than anybody in the world played it. And there's licks that he invented that he played that some of the best guitarists in the world struggle playing what he played. But, of course, living that kind of lifestyle, you make enemies. And he was in love or had the hots for some woman, if I remember right. And this other guy, very popular and had sort of some uh, crime partners and so on. Well, that was his girl and Robert Johnson was trying to steal his girl and press this girl with his playing. And one night they poured some poison. They know he loved to drink. They poured poison in his bottle and he sat there and drank that bottle and drank every bit of that poison that was in that bottle and he died and he was 27 years old. And so it just seems that one after another after another, you have these rock and roll stars who in some cases will come out and tell you, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I sold my soul to the devil to get what I got. Uh, Katy Perry, who used to grew up, who grew up in a, I would say, quasi-Christian home. Same thing. Her daddy was a Pentecostal or a charismatic evangelist. Grew up singing in churches and then admitted that she, in an interview, she sold her soul to the devil. And that's what gave her the rise to the top that she had. Uh, she's not died at 27 years old, but... Uh, it really happens. And there, like I said, there's an entire list of names of rock and roll stars that have died at the age of 27. And when I saw that the Apollo 1, and I'm doing some research in that, when I saw that the Apollo 1 astronauts, I always felt like those three men dying in that capsule was was not just an accident, that it was... I don't think it was done by human hands, but I think it was an initiatory burnt offering sacrifice on the 27th day of the year, January 27th. Now, as far as the number 27, it is based on three, okay? Well, we know what's in Genesis 3. When she saw that the tree was good for food, uh, when she saw that um, it was pleasant to the eyes, when she saw that it was desired to make one wise, she ate of the fruit, gave also to her husband, and he did eat. And what you have in that story is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the basis for the number three. So now follow this. We have, we have Adam and Eve, we have Cain. He's the third person to ever be on the earth. And who does he turn out to be? A murderer. Killing his own brother. Cain's lineage is eradicated off of the earth. There is no lineage of Abel. So the lineage of every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth ended up being from... Seth, who was the third son of Adam and Eve. Then from Seth, you go all the way down, you follow the lineage, you get to Noah. Noah then has how many sons? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And everybody in this world is a descendant of one, two, or all three of those three men. So the sins of Adam and Eve handed down through the bloodline to Seth, the third son. Then going through Moses, our sin nature 
given to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three sons, so that now for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Does that make sense to everybody so far? So then the sin nature is carried down to a man by the name of Abraham. And we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob still, Jacob has a sin nature, does he not? So Jacob then, he has, of course, the 12 sons or the 12 tribes. His first son was who? Can anybody tell me who the first son of Jacob was? Huh? Reuben. Second son. Simeon, third son, Levi. And Levi was a murderer. Levi and his brother went in after their sister Dinah was raped and went in and slaughtered the men of that town. So what is the third book of the Bible? Huh? Leviticus named after who? Levi, the third son. And open your Bible to Leviticus. And look at the first chapter of Leviticus. And tell me, if you look at verses 1, 2, and 3... What does the book of Leviticus deal with? In fact, look at verse 3. Sacrifice. And in the case of verse 3, it's a burnt sacrifice. Do you know how many chapters Leviticus has? I'm waiting for Kevin to find it. 27. Which is 3 times 3 times 3. And it deals with the Old Testament method of the remission of man's sins. Through animal sacrifice, a substitutionary atonement. Okay? It has 27 chapters. Skip forward now to the New Testament, which has how many books? 27. And in the New Testament, we have the real, true, and only right sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. When he began his ministry, how old was he? 30. When... He was to be hung on the cross. How old was he then? 33. And how many pieces of silver was he sold for? 30. And how many crosses were there on Golgotha that day? Because he was numbered with the transgressors. Numbered. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And they were all laid upon him for our benefit so that you and I would not have to suffer for our transgressions. He was the sacrifice. Somebody say amen. Okay. And um, what's the last words he said? Some of you have seen me do this, and you may not have seen me do this. Have you ever heard a preacher say that in the Old Testament, when the high priest went into the most holy place and he offered the final atonement for sin, he would come out of the tabernacle and proclaim to everybody, it is accomplished. Has anybody ever heard that? You mean I'm the only one? I heard that from I don't know how many preachers that that's why Jesus said it is finished when he was on the cross that he was following that the tradition of the and I'm telling you, every time I hear tradition now and Jews I just don't fall for it anymore 
What is the real reason why Jesus said, it is finished? Well, let's look in our Bibles. Let's take that phrase and type it in. It is finished. It's only found two places in the whole Bible. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And in James chapter 1, it says, when, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Just like, oh, I thought that was up on the screen. Why is it not on the screen? That is odd. But it's the only other place in the whole Bible, it is the only other place in the whole Bible where the phrase, it is finished, is located. It's in the book of James. And it tells you that when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And when Jesus said the words, it is finished, it brought forth death. So in the 27 books of the New Testament, sin is done. It's over with. There remaineth now no more sacrifice for sins. Amen? So that's what I'm working on. That 27 Club deal. And um, the Apollo 1 sacrifice. I believe it was. I don't know to what end and to what aim. But I b do believe that absolutely spirits were involved in sacrificing those three men. Okay? Do what now? Okay. Very good, Ronnie. Very good. Any other questions? Who else wants a long ride home? Yes, Joshua. Yeah. In what direction were they taken? To the north. So the question is, is it just lost people Um I don't know. It, to me, it's, it is beyond interesting. To me, it, it, it means something when God said to Israel on at more than two occasions, when you have been taken, even if it's to the uttermost part of the heaven, from thence will I come and get you. Okay? And... To me, it is God saving the remnant of Israel like he promised he would. Um, saving the remnant of the people of Israel, those who have already had their names written in the book of life. They just don't know it yet. Okay. Um, now, if you're asking if it's going to be some of us. Um, I cannot answer that question yet. I, I just, I don't know the answer to that, to that question yet. Uh, will some of us be taken off of this world to some other place and um, God rescuing us somehow, some way? When he did say in Matthew 24... That he would send his angels to gather his elect from one end of heaven to the other. It would seem possible that God meant exactly what he said. That they would be gathered from places in the heaven. The second heaven. Okay. And again, all of that's just, it's theoretical to me right now. Okay. But when, when I... 
it, when, when I did this Watchman, after we came back from MUFON, all the trouble I had doing that Watchman, I knew then that God had held me back from it because of what, I almost said his name, Jack Webb, <laughs> or whatever, yeah, did I say it right? Okay, I wanted to make sure that Jack Webb had told me, he, what he had confirmed in me was, there was literally a program of these aliens to steal human beings. Because that was the first thing that came to my mind when he said there was like children on there and I'm going, okay, that's what people describe these aliens as like little children. But he said, no, they were not aliens. They were human children on board this craft. And he said, somehow, some way, I knew that they had been abducted and they were not going to be taken back. They were not going to be returned to their parents. This was not a one night joy ride and then we'll all be back in our beds asleep the next morning. They were gone for life, is what he felt he knew in his heart, in his mind. And then the question that my daughter asked me, thank you, Alicia, was how is it that God allowed these little children, some of them, Probably not even of the age of accountability to be taken already. And believe it or not, not a week after she asked me that question, Jack Webb sent me an email and asked me the same thing. You know, I, I, you know, I thought at least it would be children who were above the age of accountability but he said, I saw children on there that I'm pretty sure weren't. How is it that they ended up being taken for life now and are in under the dominion of these evil devils? How, is, how could that be? So here's how I explained it to her. Here's how I explained it to him. And especially with Jack Webb. I said, there is no doubt in my mind, Jack, that at age five, you were probably at that line of whether or not you could, you had, the, you had sufficient knowledge to know the difference between good and evil. In other words, maybe he wasn't at the age of accountability. So how was it then that, it, it, that he could have been taken from his home and taken and put in bondage forever? And I told him, I said, there is no doubt in my mind that God wanted you to be this child that had this experience where an attempt was made by superior beings, mind you, superior in every way. They had the technology, the ability to take him from his back porch and put him in their ship and there wasn't a thing he could do about it. So when he said to me that he felt like that his fear is what kept him from going up, I immediately said to him, uh, no, I don't, I don't believe that. I think God pulled you back and kept you from going up into that ship. And I said, I think God wanted you to experience that. And I said, I don't know the full reason of it, but I know that right here and right now, you have told me your story and you met a guy with probably the biggest mouth in America. 
and I'm going to tell everybody that I can the story that you told me. And the only thing I worry about is to make sure I keep calling him Jack Webb. Okay? But so that his story could be told, that he would have that experience, because I think there's coming a day when even the most hardened individual who says there is no way, no how, no such things as UFOs, aliens, nothing like that, I think they're all about to change their mind one of these days. And I think it's probably going to come sooner rather than later. Okay? And here is a man now who has a unique opportunity to tell his Christian brothers and sisters and lost people that those entities are not all powerful and that truly greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody say amen. So I think that, I think that was a big part of it. Um, when it comes to children who have attained to the age of accountability, let me explain. Does everybody know what that is? Okay. The age of accountability is children before a certain point in their life, they are not held accountable for anything they have done wrong simply because they do not know the difference between right and wrong. It would be, God forbid, if you had a child or a grandchild who had Down syndrome and they were very severely retarded is the word that they used to use. Those people, more than likely throughout lifetime, they live to be 70 years old, will never have the understanding of the difference between right and wrong. They are not saved, they are safe. And God makes that clear in the story that he tells in Numbers 13 and 14 when he tells the Israelites, all of you 20 years old and above, you're going to walk in a big circle for 40 years until you all die in the wilderness. But your children, and God specifically used these words, who did not know the difference between good and evil, they, I'm not going to make them suffer in the wilderness. I'm going to let them go in the promised land. So clearly God was not going to hold them accountable for any sin uh, that they had committed because they didn't know the difference. Now, what is the age? How old is the age of accountability? Well, I don't know, but I think that every child reaches a point. It's like um, I'm looking at my three amigos back here, Roland and Lawson and Hunter. Now, Roland and Lawson and Hunter, they all walk around all day long now with all of their clothes on. A few years ago, you couldn't get them to put clothes on. And they didn't have a problem with it. Because they didn't understand that they were naked. Remember the first thing that happened with Adam and Eve when they... First sin. What's the first thing that, that dawned on them? We're naked. And who was there to see it? There was nobody in the world, right? It was just Adam and Eve. But we're naked. What difference does it make? We're married. And that was the first thing they woke up to was the fact that the shame of their nakedness appeared. They, and that was when their eyes were open to the difference between good and evil. But then you see as children grow up, they don't run out of the bathroom naked anymore. At least they'll put on maybe a pair of underwear or whatever shorts they're going to wear to bed. But they don't like being around 
people naked anymore because it's an embarrassment. It's a shame to them. And I think it's at that point that they start really understanding the difference between what's good and what's evil. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So the bottom line is God in his foreknowledge, those children that were already on that ship, did God already know them from before the foundation of the world? Did he not know that no matter what chess game he played with them, he knew every move they were going to make? And he knew that no matter what happened to them, they were never going to heaven to begin with. The Bible teaches us that when it teaches us about Pharaoh. God raised up Pharaoh who had this wicked, hard heart toward the Jews specifically so that he could show forth his power to Israel by making Pharaoh as mean and rotten and, uh, and ugly as he was. God had to first get Israel to cry out in their bondage. Well, the only way to do that is to raise up a Pharaoh who is the meanest one that's ever lived. And once he did that, Sure enough, Israel began to complain about their bondage and God heard their complaint and God sent a savior and God saved them from that. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Any other questions? All right. Uh, take your Bible. Genesis chapter three, if you would turn there. Where is my... PowerPoint. There we go. Why won't it show up on my screen here? Give me a second. What's up there on the screen? Genesis 3? All right, good deal. That sounds like a good place to start. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, since we've been talking about gods, I'll go through this and then... Um, in a few minutes, maybe we'll take a break, we'll come back, and then I'll let y'all go home, all right? Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the, the focus of this particular teaching is that there are gods in this world. They are devils. They are angels. The book of Psalms says that God has made man a little lower than the angels. But I believe the Bible teaches, and I believe you can see it very clearly, that man wants to be as the gods. How many of you would believe that? Say amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. This was in the promise made by Lucifer to Eve and then thus to Adam of what would happen if they disobeyed God. That basically the serpent is telling Eve that the only way to ascend up to Godhood is for you to disobey God. That's what he's saying. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That was a direct lie, by the way. A direct lie. Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Remember what we said about the age of accountability. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Father, we ask your blessings on your word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, so now let's examine this just for a few minutes. This is called ascension. Where is it that the gods dwell? 
Most of them, I would say, I know that there are gods and devils that are here on this earth. Obviously, they work in and among us and against us while we are here on this earth. But it is also obvious to me that they have access to the heavenly realm and a God, be it an, a, an angel or a devil, could have access to practically any part of the second heaven that they want to be in. You understand what I'm saying when I say second heaven, don't you? The sky is the first heaven. The outer space, what we would call outer space, the universe, that is the second heaven, which is where all of the stars reside. Then the Bible calls it the heaven of heavens, which Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, that he knew someone that had ascended into the third heaven, which is the realm where God lives and his temple exists. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Now, if I were to, if I were to just present two things to you, you tell me which one is the greater light and which one is the lesser light. Okay, well, this will be easy. All right. So the sun and the moon, which is the greater light? Which is the lesser light? The moon. Okay. Christ and Satan. Which is the greater light? Christ is. He's the son of righteousness. Isn't it interesting that the word Lucifer means light bearer. And that is precisely what the moon is. The moon does not, in spite of the, what the flat earth people say. The moon does not have its own source of light. It reflects the light from the sun. Therefore, it is the lesser light. Christ is the greater light. Uh, and the greater light rules over the day. We are children of the day, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But there are also children of darkness who rules over them. The lesser light rules over the children of darkness. How about if I do it this way? Uh, New Testament, Old Testament. The New Testament is what? The greater light. Because think of, think of the examples now. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face shone, right? But is Christ's face going to shine brighter than Moses? Oh, yeah. So the Old Testament is a light still, but it's a lesser light. Does that make sense to everybody? You can take that and you can literally apply it to all kinds of things in the Bible. You can apply it to all kinds of things in nature and so on. Um, he made the stars also. Um, are there any stars in the sky right now? Yeah. They're all up there. Why can't we see them? Because sun's out. Now think of, what, think of what the Bible tells us. He, this is what God told Abraham. He told it to Isaac. told it to Jacob. He tells it to us, I believe, that we will shine as lights in a dark place. Um, I believe that we will take the place of the one-third of the angels that are kicked out of heaven. We will be as the stars of heaven. But think about it. While Christ is still up there, is there any way the world can see us? No. We're just the stars. If Christ is here and we're here with him, 
Who are they going to be able to see? Who should they only be able to see? Christ and not us. Amen? But as the world gets darker and we still remain here, we start shining brighter and brighter, don't we? And let me suggest to each and every one of you, God is still not done saving sinners. And He's not done using us to do it. And it may have to get... Joe Biden might have to be president again for another four years. Oh, come on now. If it means we can save more people... Verse 17, and God sent them in the, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The fourth day, the number four has to do with the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the number four also has to do with the spiritual realm because these lights are all part of the spiritual realm. The sun is, Christ is the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. Um, the stars being angels, so on and so forth. They are, this is part of the spiritual realm that he's describing and it is above us. The Bible says that when it came to us and the angels, God has made us a little lower than the angels. So we are beneath them all right so now take a look at this i call this layers of creation first we have the most high god which is god our father god the son jesus christ and god the holy ghost is there anything above them no nothing is so think of what Lucifer wants to do. I will be like the Most High. It takes him ascending into heaven. But Lucifer has a problem. Every time we see Lucifer, he's falling. Isaiah 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Then we look in Revelation 12. Satan, Lucifer, kicked out of heaven. Then we get to Christ is going to set his kingdom up. An angel comes down with the key to the bottomless pit, opens it up, casts him in there. And then how long is he going to fall? A thousand years. How do you scream while you're falling for a thousand years? You know, when people fall, they're going, ah! Ah! But every time you see Lucifer, he's falling, poor guy. I would say beneath the Most High God, Christ, the Holy Ghost, you would have Michael the Archangel, the most powerful angel that there is. He is the Archangel, one of the chief angels. Um, beneath him, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Now, I'm not saying Gabriel is some sort of lesser angel than, let's say, Lucifer. But Gabriel pretty much is sort of a one-job one angel. What does Gabriel do? He's a messenger. He delivers messages, okay? We have the prince of the people of Persia. We know that... Um, Gabriel tried to deliver the message. The prince of the people of Persia withstood him. It took Michael, who is greater in power and might, to fight the prince of the people of Persia so that Gabriel could deliver his message. We have angels like Gog, the chief prince of Magog, Meshach and Tubal. 
We have the holy angels that are greater in power and might than man. You find that in 2 Peter chapter 2, 11. And then you find in Psalm 8, verse 5, about man. God has made us a little lower than the angels. Okay? So, we're not gods. We're not of the heavenly realm. And I wrote this list at about 2.30 in the morning. So, if I don't have them quite in the order you would think they are, it's just because I was tired. Okay? It's not because I want to start some big theological fight, all right? So just bear with me. Now, in Genesis chapter 11, let's notice now what, since, since Satan said those words to Eve, that if she ate of the fruit, then her eyes would be open and she would be as gods. Gods are above us. So now what is in the nature of man, now that we have this knowledge of good and evil in us, this sin nature? In Genesis 11, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they're on the earth. Now they're, they're in a plain. They're in a low spot, like a valley. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Slime, which is tar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a what? A tower. Whose top, militarily, militarily, if you think the way generals think when they're ordering a battle, any army that has high ground or a high position do they have the potential of doing better in the battle than an army who cannot gain a high position? So what was, what was one of the biggest problems Germany had in World War II on D-Day that we had an advantage of? It was the glorious Luftwaffe of Germany we had destroyed a lot of their planes and they just, in fact, the truth of it was, they were scared to death to put their planes in the air during the D-Day invasion because they couldn't afford to lose anymore. And Chris, we had a ton of them. So what advantage did we have on D-Day? We knew exactly where all the Germans were, pretty much. We had that high ground advantage. So let's build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto where? So you see what is in man's nature now. Man is not content with staying here on the ground. We want to ascend. We want to go higher and higher and higher here. A city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. By the way, what did God end up doing after this? He divided their tongues. Then they naturally divided by those tongues. If you hear somebody way across a field speaking your language, naturally you're going to go over there because you can understand what he's saying. And people are dividing up by the languages. And then we know in the days of Peleg, that's when God divided the earth. And anybody who can't see that South America and Africa fit together just like that. Anybody who can't see that, it's got to be crazy, right? So not only are they now divided by family line and tongue. And then in the days of Peleg, crunch. God put half of them on one hemisphere, half of them on the other hemisphere, and said, stay away from each other for a while. And that's exactly what happened. 
So now, this is not really the Tower of Babel. It may be close to what it looked like, but you understand what they're doing. They don't know exactly. So they figured if they built a tower so many cubits tall, then that might get them to heaven. They just don't know what we know now with the James Webb Telescope. How far is heaven from here? It's even further than we thought. That's bad for us. Amen? Then they started building even larger towers. What were they trying to do? Ascend. Let's see if we can reach heaven. And you go back on all these old settlements in these old places in Persia and Iraq and in the Middle East and they have towers everywhere and that's man trying to get up there. Here's the Tower of London. Uh, an, another way of trying to get man up high. Now let me show you this. Does anybody know what this is? This is New York City somewhere around the turn of the 20th century. I want you to notice all the buildings. They're all made of brick. How many stories tall are they? About seven, eight. Why couldn't they back then build a 40-story building out of brick? Why couldn't they do it? Huh? We have an architect. Literally, we have an architect. Once you get so high with a brick building, the weight of the bricks above start crushing the bricks down below, and you can't do it. It wasn't until they figured out to make steel beams and weld them together and let the steel beams carry the weight straight down into the ground and then you could use bricks as a facade but the bricks by no means were holding the building up it was the steel and the iron beams that were holding that building up and so now we had buildings like that and we're building taller buildings we're trying to ascend then they said oh I like this one let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And I found this not too long after September 11th, 2001. And I could not believe my eyes. This was a brochure where they were selling office space in the World Trade Towers. And here's what it said. The closest some of us will ever get to heaven. That just makes the hair stands up on the some of you that still have that hair okay so then we decided buildings won't get us there so in 1903 two brothers who used to build bicycles and have a bicycle shop learned from their mother about aerodynamics and they built the first airplane does anybody know how far the first trip was I don't so somebody look it up let me move on it didn't go very far we'll just say it that way it didn't go very far okay but we started something that's at the turn of the century 1903 okay then so from roughly 4004 B.C., which is about when the creation was made, to 1902, 5,900 years, we never knew what this world looked like above 50, 70, 80, 100 feet. We never could see our farms and our cities from a high vantage point for almost 6,000 years. But now, all of a sudden, in one day, that all changed. And then, so from 1903 
1961, we've only been flying 59 years. And in 59 years, we figured out how to fly above the atmosphere of the earth to put a man for the first time, an American man for the first time in outer space. Isn't that something? That it took us 5,900 years to get 40 feet off the ground in an airplane. And in just 59 years after that, we're a couple miles up in the air. And that was Alan Shepard, 1961. What happened eight years later? We flew over 250,000 miles away from our planet, our home. That happened in just eight years. The technology, when Kennedy said, let's go to the moon, the technology and the materials needed didn't even exist. We made them happen in less than eight years. Can you imagine? I want you to think about this. Where are we going? As a species, where are we, are we done now? Are we done going higher? So what's being talked about now? Mars. And if your mom or your dad or your grandparents said, ah, we'd never get to the moon. Well, they were wrong. And if your granddaddy said, there ain't nobody on Mars, and never will be nobody on Mars. We're not too far. And then, what about this one? Warp drive. A way, let me, let me explain it to you like this. Let's say that right over here is Earth. And let's say that right over here is the planet that we found. And it's 800,000 light years away. That means if you could travel as fast as light travels, in 800,000 years, you could finally be there. But that's impossible. So we're just about, Joshua, on the verge of being able to do this. Fold space so that the two places now are just a few hours away from each other instead of 800,000 years away from each other. And I don't understand the technology, and I guarantee you, you don't either. But devils know how to do it, because they do it all the time. And God knows how to do it, because the Bible said that when God came down, He bowed the heavens. Am I right on that? He did exactly that. God warped space come here okay so my point in all of this is this man since the devil spoke those words to Eve our ancestor and said ye shall be as gods the gods live up there man now wants to live up there and will he do it I believe according to the Bible it's going to happen. And I don't know, but what Joe Biden can come out tomorrow and say, I say, before I'm done being president, we ought to put men on different planets. And something happened scientifically that we never knew before could happen next week. And we could literally be there in a year okay that's how fast we're developing as a people look at look at this Isaiah 14 look at what Lucifer said how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which sits weak in the nations for thou hast said in thine heart I will descend into heaven and you know what I believe I believe that 
this Lucifer is more than just the devil. I believe it's every person who chooses not to follow God, who wants to bear the light and then wants to ascend up into heaven without Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. Ezekiel 28, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I said in the seed of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And what I'm trying to get across to you is, is that this is man in his attempt to become God's. And man is doing it right now. Whatever the gods want to do or can do, man is on his way right now. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Who remembers John Denver? I, I've been to Colorado and I drove through Aspen, so that's what made me think of him. Does anybody know what religion John Denver was? He wasn't a Baptist, I'll say that. Huh? He wasn't a Presbyterian. He belonged to a cult called Erhard Seminary Training. It was run by a German guy by the name of Werner Erhard. And Werner Erhard taught his disciples, and John Denver was one of them, John, and John Denver actually said this in a, I think it was a Life magazine article that was written right after he really started becoming famous back in the early 70s. He said that he honestly believed that before he died, he said, I will become a God. I will become a God. And that is in the heart of of probably most people, not just rock stars, not just rich people, but most people make themselves out to be a God, believing that one day they will become a God. Um, and we see it in all the religions, whether it's the Indian guru, who through his transcendental meditation believes that he can reach and ascend to new heights. He can ascend to heaven. Have you ever heard of astral projection? Has anybody ever heard of that before? Do you know what it is? Huh? Soul travel. You believe that you can meditate yourself into a trance and that your soul literally leaves your body and you can go anywhere in the heavens, in the universe, that you want to go in the moment, in an instant. The only problem is, you always have to come back down in that body when you wake up. But that's a form of divinity. It's a form of deity. It is a form of man becoming a god. Saint! Pope John Paul II. When you become a saint, basically in Catholic ideology, you're a god now. You know what makes you a god? The fact that people can pray to you and your statue and you can answer their prayers for them. Who used to be our Roman Catholic people? Raise your hand. Aren't you glad that God saved you out of that? Because God said, thou shalt have no other God's before me. The Jews believe that by doing good deeds, praying to God, helping others, that they can ascend to Godhood 
through following the Ten Commandments. It never worked for Moses, it didn't work for Paul, and it isn't going to work for them either. Muslims apparently believe that if you fly a plane through a building, you'll achieve godhood. The uh, circumambulation of people around the Kaaba at Mecca. Does anybody know how many times they have to walk around the Kaaba? Does anybody know? Seven. Do you know why it's seven? Manly Hall actually figured this out. He said it's because of the seven planetary bodies that circle the sun and each one of these people who walk around the Kaaba seven times, they actually believe that that will make them one of the heavenly luminaries that circle the sun. They'll be gods in the heavens. And it's why they walk counterclockwise, because that's the way the planets go around the sun, is counterclockwise. What is that? Freemasonry which teaches that if you ascend to the either in the Scottish Rite, the 33 degrees, or the York Rite, the 13 degrees, and you're wearing your Masonic apron. I remember talking to a family one time years ago about this, and the wife of the family was an Eastern star, and I brought up the issue of you believe that if you wear the Masonic apron, then you can automatically go to heaven. And she responded, she said, I know that what you're saying is true. I've done enough Masonic funerals to know that that's what they believe. That if you do good deeds and you wear your Masonic apron, when God sees you wearing that apron, he automatically brings you into Godhood because you're a good person. And it's a lie. Amen? Why do Indian tribes, First Nation tribes in America, why do they take their, the, the bodies of their dead and raise them up on platforms and basically let whatever creatures that fly around eat their bodies? Usually it's birds. Because they believe that the birds eating the pieces of their body will carry the pieces of that body up into heaven and they will be up there. Why did the Vikings and other Nordic religions burn or use a funeral pyre to burn the bodies of their loved ones? It's because they believe that through the smoke that their soul ascended up into heaven through the smoke of the funeral pyre. Isn't that silly? But that's what people have believed for thousands of years. You ever seen these guys wearing these man buns? You know what? I'm just, I'm just ornery enough to want to carry on a big pocket knife and walk up behind these guys and just slice it off. Chris, I know you are too. A friend of our ministry, his son actually was in Bible college, and it was in this Bible college that his son learned how to pray to multiple gods like Thor and Odin. And he sent me a picture of his son. He now sings in a rock and roll band, and he's got one of these top knots. Bible college student, seminary student. And I wrote him back and I said, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the purpose of the top knot, whether it's Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Maorian, or whatever, the purpose of the top knot is their belief that that's how God reaches down and picks you up and takes you and puts you in to the high places of heaven because he can grab a hold of that knot. 
If I wore one of those and my mom saw it, she would be grabbing a hold of it and dragging me to my room, pulling my belt off to whip me. Or the idea of just reincarnation. That over every life that you live, see that symbol there in the middle? That looks like a sidewards eight. It's called an infinity symbol. Have you ever heard of the Skinwalker Ranch, anybody? One of the scientists who was as skeptical as all get out about the things that were going on at the Skinwalker Ranch was invited out there. Once he got out there, they were going through one of the old farmhouses, and while they were standing there, out of the, just out of thin air, this infinity symbol just showed up, lit up, inside that building. And that scientist just stood there staring at that. And finally it went away, and they said, do you believe us now? He said, yeah, just please don't tell anybody. But that's just the idea that if you keep living your life, you will get it better and better and better and better and better until you become a god. You remember the movie Groundhog Day? What was it about? Bill Murray, who was a jerk, who plays that part very well, who kept reliving the same day, day after day. He, and no matter if he got killed, shot himself, got run over by trucks, electrocuted himself. Don't, I don't like electrocuting. But no matter what happened, he always woke up again on Groundhog Day. And the, they asked the producers of the film... How many actual days did he live? And they said, we didn't really put this in the movie, but it was in our minds. It was like into the hundreds of thousands of days that he had relived the same day over and over again. That's why in one scene he sits down with the woman that he's in love with and he tells her, I'm a God. She said, you're God? He said, no, not the God. I'm a God. And then he starts telling everything that's going to happen in that restaurant. You remember that scene? That was the 33rd day of the year. Groundhog Day, February 2nd. 33rd day of the year. Okay? Uh, I could go on with this forever and forever and forever and forever. But I won't do that because... Some of you might end up becoming gods during that time. <laughs> the beast believes he's God. He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar, after he's shown what's going to happen, he says, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? To himself he was a god. Herod set a day, arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave shout and saying, It is the voice of a god and not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. I guess there went his godhood. Amen. There is only one God, but let me... Um, I've been reading this verse this morning. and I'm going to finish with this. The verse in Psalm 82, I have said, are, where God said, I have said, ye are gods. Remember that? And all of ye children are the most high. In John 10, 34, Jesus actually quoted that verse. Because he said to all the Jews there that he was the son of God. And they accused him of blasphemy. How can you make yourself equal with God? 
Verse 34 of John chapter 10, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Then he said, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Now here's what I want to ask you. Will we become gods one of these days? According to the scriptures, yes. And how so? Not that we are equal with the Most High God. No, I don't mean that. What I mean is, we will become a immortal. And death will have no more victory on us. Somebody say amen. amen. Two, we will never sin ever again. Amen. amen. Three, no more pains and aches in our bodies. Somebody say amen. And, my favorite, we can go anywhere through space we want to in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. But he said he reserves that only if he called them gods. And what he meant by gods was of the, like we're going to be like the angels of God in heaven. That is reserved to whom the word of God came. And my question to you today is, do you believe the word of God? So you got two choices. A, Satan said, if you disobey God, you can become a God. B, God said, obey the gospel. You know how you obey the gospel? You believe it. Who hath believed our report is what Paul said. If you believe what God said, ye shall live forever and never die. I've buried enough people since I've been pastor here. One of the things that I can clearly see that God has used me for in this church is to bury the people that I grew up under in this church. That was hard. To bury some people in this church that were my friends. That was hard. To bury my dad. One of these days, I may have to bury my mother. Or my wife. I've already buried one grandchild. I don't want to bury another one. But I know that every one of these that I bury, I want to know beyond a doubt where they're going when I put their body in the ground. I want to know where they are. I know where Bonnie is. All you other widows, I know where your husbands are and they are, they're behaving. But if I have to bury everybody in this church, I'll do it. Just don't make me guess about where you are. Make sure that I know and make sure that you know. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Uh, before we do, where quickly, I'll give you the, the schedule for tomorrow. Um... We generally don't serve breakfast on Sunday, so don't show up for breakfast. Cook your own egg. Um, 9.45, we'll have like a little assembly. And then uh, for the, for during that time, usually it's Sunday school time, but we do, we're going to do some special singing tomorrow. So we've already got some young ladies that are going to sing for us tomorrow. Ladies, are you excited? 
Sounds like hope grabbed a rope and wrung the necks of some other people to get them to sing with her is what it sounded like. So hoping some of her, hoping the pips are going to sing tomorrow. And uh, our family is going to sing tomorrow. Do y'all want Sweetie Pie to sing tomorrow? Yeah. You tell her. Okay, when you see her, say, we want you to sing tomorrow. All right? And she knows what song I'm talking about. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. I've enjoyed it. Um, I want you to pray for these fine men that have been with us this morning. They have, listen, it's been a joy for them to be here today. They have not bothered me in any way. Uh, actually, I was kind of hoping for a little bit better shots. But, okay. You know, CGI and post-production, you can do a lot with it, right? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, pray for one another. Uh, at some point, at some point, I might be able to tell you what God is doing in Kenya. I will just tell you that it is huge. Okay? You know, while you guys are standing here, I want to show you something. You see these two things right here? We have um, two radio stations in Kenya. And one of them is in the county of Samburu, Kenya. The second one is in the county of Turkana, Kenya. And when we were in Samburu, there's very little rain up there and people actually starved to death for not having any water to drink. So we decided as a church we were going to try to raise money to dig a well that would be publicly accessible so that the people could have free water up there. And so we tried to raise money. A lot of it wasn't coming in. And then what happened was somebody that follows our ministry, a relative of theirs died. And they took part of his life insurance and paid the remainder of the balance needed to dig that well. A man had to die so that others could live. And we were all crying. So they dug the well. Uh, we found water. It wasn't very deep at all. We put in a... Um, uh, solar power, electric generator there, uh, put in the pump, built a big tank from to pump the water into, and it's got a lease on the land that says that for eternity, that land is always going to be publicly accessible so that nobody tries to take over the well and tries to sell the water because they'll do that over there. And they asked me to come over to do the well dedication. I thought I was just going to go over and lead in a prayer. And they had this long, it was all day thing. We had all these children singing and everything like that. And the governor of Samburu was there with me. And the schoolmaster at the school was there. And he was wearing this over his shoulder like this. And I talked to him and I said, you know, I like that. Well, he took it off and he gave it to me. I said, oh, no, no, no. He said, no, take it. Well, I'd learned over there, you don't not take something, especially a goat. So <laughs> I took this and I was wearing it. And the governor of Samburu, people were giving speeches. And the governor of Samburu said, where did you get this? And I said, the schoolmaster gave it to me. And he said, you're fixing to get another one. And I didn't know at the time what it meant. And there were two members of parliament that were sitting next to the governor. And I noticed that when they got up to speak, they took, they took this and they walked up to the microphone and they spoke. And when they sat down, they gave it to the next guy and he took his up there and went to speak. Now, this had been sent to me before I ever went to Kenya. And when I saw those men stand up with this stick and then speak to those people, it dawned on me what this was. It was an old tradition among their people that whoever held this 
And whoever wore this was regarded as an elder among those people. And whoever held this had the right to speak to their people. And they had given me this before I ever came over there. And I came over here and told that story. And I cried. And here's thousands of people over there in that area that have told our church, we trust you to be our elders. And we give you permission to speak among our people and to be heard. That's worth a billion dollars to me. Amen? And to think we had an offer to sell our radio station out there for two million dollars and turned it down. And all I got out of it was this lousy stick. But that stick is worth more to me than anything in this ministry. And I thank God for it. Father, we ask you to continue to bless the good people of Samburu and Turkana. We thank you, Lord, for introducing us to the elders there in Kenya, the various churches and the different pastors, especially Elder Etole, 100 years old, who prays for this church every day. I pray, dear God, that you would bless them with the water of life freely both from the ground and from us. Father, bless these that have come into your house to hear you today. Bless our service again tomorrow. Then dismiss us in your care. We thank you, God, for all that you've done with us and all that you've used us for. We love you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. See you at 945 in the morning.